Hello out there, everyone, and welcome to the uh, FTEM webinar for the DIA. My name is Caroline Noble. Uh, with me helping to, to give this webinar today are Bree Schuler and Kim Ernstrom. Uh, we comprise the IFTDIS technical team and the FTEM technical team, and also uh, Bill Growl, who is your agency lead for FTEM. So we'll have an hour today where I'll go through uh, the goal being an overview of the application and the process for completing FTM monitoring. And um, we'll allow some time um, for questions at the end. But before I get going, uh, I wanted to give Bill a chance to address you guys. Um, so go ahead, Bill. OK, thanks, Caroline. Um, yeah, and thanks. Uh, the whole IFTDIS technical team there for arranging these webinars and also for developing the new FTEM system. You know, it was pretty uh, rapid development and uh, you, I know you, you guys worked really hard uh, towards this release and um, being geospatial is really a big step forward from the previous system we had. And I want to thank the attendees also. I know it's the middle of the fire year. People are very busy. Um, but really, I want to say this new FTEM system has the potential to be very good for Indian country because it will it'll show that we put fuels treatments where they're needed. And also, a very high percentage of them are impacted by wildfires. So. It might also have the potential um, in many instances to show that Indian country fuels treatments keep wildfires small, which is another huge story. Um, yeah, so it wasn't that long ago, I guess 2012, when I, I was also a, a tribal fuel specialist. And so I know that reporting often is just um, something we have to do. You know, I, I get it, um, but I, ask people to please keep in mind that the national leadership as well as the oversight agencies like the Department of the Interior, Office of Wildland Fire, OWF, uh, OMB, GAO, um, they'll be reviewing our FTM reporting. And so we need to use FTEM as a way to show that Indian Country Fuels Management Program is, is a good investment and that it's worth the funding that received that we receive. So um, with that, I'll turn it back to uh, the IFTDIS team for a walkthrough of the system. All right, great. Thank you, Bill. I'm going to approach this like uh, most of you guys have never been in this new system, which I believe is the case, or potentially even in to IFTDIS. So the first thing to point out is that FTEM, uh, the access to it is within the IFTDIS application. Uh, Right now, I'm logged into IFTDIS, and you'll notice that I have an FTEM on my navigation bar. This is the way that you access FTEM, the point being that you need an IFTDIS account in order to request an FTEM account. So if you already have an IFTDIS account, you should see that little FTEM on your navigation bar across the top. You can click on that and request access to the system. Um, It'll be automatically approved in, in many cases if you use a .gov email. If you do not, uh, it'll go to an agency administrator um, for the BIA to approve your account. And while you're selecting that account, if you feel that you're going to be um, entering monitoring data or serve in what we call a role of editor <clears throat> that I'll be explaining more, you can just check as you're creating an account, I would like to be an editor, um, and you'll get approved um, for both access and the editor role in one step. So that's the key thing is first create an IFTDIS account if you don't have one, and then um, request FTEM access. This is um, <clears throat> a one-time thing. You will have to, I shouldn't say one time, you have to um, renew passwords every 60 days due to security requirements. But once you have that, um, you won't have to go through that requesting process again. You can just log in and click. So once you have access to FTEM, when you click on FTEM, you'll um, end up here at the, the landing page for the application. Um, it does sort of operate as its own system once you're logged in and click on FTEM. So though it's, it's connected to IFTDIS, it is um, its own little independent application within it. 
So several things to point out on this page. Uh, first thing, I guess, is that there, there's more than one way to get from one place to another. So you'll notice we have FTM monitoring, which will be where we'll spend the bulk of our time today. Um, and you can access that here through this button or here on the navigation bar, the same with FTM reports. You can click either one. It'll take you to the same place. You have a return to IFTDIS uh, available. It'll take you back to the IFTDIS application. And then FTEM account management, which is where you manage your, your personal profile, which I'll show in just a second. Uh, the other thing here is some quick links to various um, help content type thing. Um, just as uh, pointing out for housekeeping purposes, we are recording this today. Um, and the recording will be posted. You can access it here um, at this link after we post it in a couple days. And we'll be sending out an email in that regard after today. Something else to point out is that there is a uh, questions box in the, the GoToWebinar panel to the right. So throughout the webinar, we do have the, the team available to answer questions. Um, we may save a lot of them till the end. You might want to give me a chance to see if I, I cover what you're wondering about. But if I don't, certainly type those questions in. And we'll try to address them as we go through. Uh, so there's various help content. There's frequently asked questions, learning how to use FTEM, getting started using permissions, for example. Just to click one of these, um, we'll show you uh, exactly how the roles and privileges work within the application. And it, to keep it very simple, um, what real, you guys are really be interested in is there's three roles of interest to you, uh, agency viewer, agency editor, and agency admin. I'm guessing that the bulk of you on the call today will be either agency editors or agency admin. And you can read this as you like in the help content, but the difference is that the agency admins are the ones that actually approve the agency editor account requests. So I just want to show you what that looks like. Um, for them as it comes in, because it's a pretty simple process. So I'm going to go now to um, a user list that, that I have access to and the agency administrators will have access to. And then I can select BLM. And this is a list of all the, um, the BLM people I do that, right? that currently have accounts. Um, and then if I pare that down to, say, agency editor, uh, the list shortens quite a bit. And if I pare that down to agency administrator, you can see it's just handful of people here that will serve uh, in the capacity of approving your accounts. So hopefully um, you're familiar with the person in your area that would be approving your account, or you can get with Bill and find out, but they'll be the ones coming in and approving your account. Just as an example, if uh, to show the people that will be serving in the agency admin role, if there's a, an agency viewer in here, these may be people that haven't gotten their approvals yet. If, if you um, you can see in the right-hand panel on the screen, it, it gives a little bit of information about this, this person. Um, this person is from the California region. They selected that when they created their account. And the administrator will click on Grant Agency Roles um, and can come in and grant the various roles as needed for agency editor for BLM. You'll notice that there are other agencies listed. Uh, we do have the ability to accommodate people who might be doing monitoring for more than one agency. Um, that'll be handled on a case-by-case -case basis, um, but we know that that does occur from time to time. So I just wanted to give you an overview of that. Most of the time, uh, you won't need to worry about it once you're into the system. Uh, you've got your roles and privileges, and you've got your access, um, and you should be good to go. So back to this page here. Um, the other things to note here, you've got the contact information bill in your case. Um, if you have specific questions about policy, um, if it's questions about button pushing, that would be more for the IFTDIS team to handle. Um, there, there is a link to the actual FTEM help content. And then there's a little bit in here about missing data. I will say from the start that FTEM, uh, now that we've made it spatial, it really is all about the data. And I'm sure that will come up as we go through here. So some things to keep in mind um, are that it may take up to 45 days after the fire start date for certain fires to show up in this system. And I'll describe how that goes um, more in detail. And then uh, treatments may take some time to become visible within the, the system. They're being pulled from NIFPORs, but the frequency um, with which you guys get them in, your agency gets all the treatments in the NIFPORs. And the, that can vary. We do check in with uh, NIFPORs nightly to pull in the most recent data. So just some caveats there to keep in mind. 
And additionally, if you have more questions about the data, this help content has uh, some specific technical documentation. If you click on that, it'll actually um, provide additional help content on both the field treatment data sources and the wildfire data sources. So something to keep in mind to peruse if you're looking in here and curious as to where this data come from, came from, excuse me, uh, and how it works. So let's see. Um, with that, I think I'm going to go ahead and go into FTEM monitoring, which is where most of the excitement occurs. Oh, there's one more thing I forgot I want to show you before we dive in here too much, which is your user profile. Sorry about that. Um, so in this case, you've got three tabs across the top. First one is your just your personal information. The second tab would be your FTEM roles. So if you want to request an additional role, like you were in here as an editor, but um, needed uh, wanted to request access to become something more, you could select it here. And then lastly, and maybe most importantly, is this FTEM preferences, which is primarily used to set um, an automatic zoom extent for the map if you choose to. So you can say set new uh, map extent, and then select who you work for, um, and then you can pick a geographic area. And that'll just automatically zoom to you to your area of interest. Um, it doesn't limit you to that area. You, you have the ability to pan and zoom throughout the entire US. But um, just want to show that because some people find it convenient to zoom right in. So with that, going into the FTM monitoring section, my preference is set for the whole United States um, just to see what's going on. Um, and you'll notice at the very top here, uh, you guys won't have this. It'll just automatically go to the BIA. Um, for myself, I have all agencies, so I'm switching to the BIA. And then you'll have uh, 2018 and 2017 available um, in your pick list for the, the year of the wildfires. Uh, it defaults to 2018. And uh, our understanding is that that's what you guys will be reporting on. You won't be reporting on 2017 fires in here. Just report on 2018, but I'll, I'll pause there and give Bill a chance to affirm that. Uh, that's correct, Caroline, and I sent that uh, guidance out in a couple emails over the last couple of weeks. Um, so we'll be okay. using this new system to reporting for 2018 fires and going forward. Okay, great. So, yeah, it should default to 2018, but just a heads up, uh, 2017, you can go look around for visual uh, display purposes, but keep in mind that um, monitoring only for 2018. So several things to point out to you. You'll notice right away that it opens up to a split screen with uh, a map and a, a sort of table listing fires on one side and also a pre-populated layer list right here. Um, so these colors are important to get familiar with. What they denote is the monitoring status of a fire. So what happens in, in FTEM is that the system is taking the treatment data and the wildfire data for location and trying to detect where there's potential interactions between the two. So if you've got a fire that's red, um, that would mean uh, check for interaction. So that doesn't mean there definitely is an interaction. It just means that there's a potential interaction that's occurring. Um, as you begin the monitoring process, it, it'll turn it to yellow status. And once the monitoring is completed, it'll turn green. Uh, and this map is dynamic with your um, list on the in this table right here. I'm giving the system a minute to catch up because it, the colors should match up uh, so that the red um, fires in the, the table match up with the red fires on the map. And this, this will filter to your, your map extent. So I might zoom in just to let it catch up to me a little bit. Um, if you scroll down this list, you'll notice that in addition to uh, wildfire data, it's separated out by point and polygon, and then also separated out by um, treatment, point and polygon. And treatments are going to have the same color coding. Uh, once you begin monitoring, um, in other words, entering data for those treatments, um, or excuse me, for those wildfires, the, the colors will correspond to the level of progress you've made in monitoring those. So 
So for some reason, let me just see what's going on here. Um, you see here, there's uh, in your list, there's both these symbols that look like um, polygons. That's to designate if you hover over it, that means that that fire is represented by a polygon. Um, and if you just get a flame icon, that means that there's only a point to represent that wildfire. So even though in this case with the Swan fire, it's 19.6 acres, um, we only have a point for that fire. Um, this rattlesnake fire, a large fire, um, 26,000 acres uh, is represented by a polygon. Maria, Kim, are you guys getting the um, the list to update? I'm not getting the colors to update here. Yeah, what I'm is, um, select uh, rattlesnake and hit treatment. So it takes you to the treatment treatment tab and then go back to the fire tab. Might reset it. When you're zoomed out okay. to the whole US, that's all of that data having to load. Um, okay. Can slow it down, so it just it needs to kind of reset. Okay, thank you. Still loading. Um, so this uh, process for monitoring, basically, you'll see four tabs right here, um, meaning that you're going to proceed. Uh, primarily from left to right. So you're going to start out on this wildfire tab and pick the wildfire that you want to, to do monitoring on. And then as you do that, you'll, uh, once you do that, you'll begin to proceed through this process. So in picking your wildfire, um, you'll either be looking for a specific wildfire, in which case you can type its name into the search box. Um, as an example here, um, I've got this Canton Lake 2 fire that, uh, Bill chose for an example for us to look at. And if I put that into the search box, it should, that one's in Oklahoma, I believe, it should um, begin searching. Uh, and there's the fire. Um, and it, as the map populates, you'll see that it's coming in. And I can select that fire. Um, and once you, you select the fire, you're going to have a variety of choices. Um, or buttons available to you. There's a zoom to button, um, which will immediately zoom me into the extent of that fire. So in this case, the Canton Lake 2 fire is represented, as we can see by the flame icon, by a point, not a polygon. It's a 2.6 acre wildfire. So in these cases where the fire is only represented by a point, um, the system does apply a buffer to try and detect interactions in that buffering distance is based on the acreage of the fire. So given that this is a small fire, uh, 2.6 acres, um, the buffer is not very big. You can see it's represented with this aqua halo um, on the screen. So in this case, the automatic buffer for 2.6 acres is reaching out and actually uh, finding a little bit of an intersection with that treatment. Um, the other thing that is populated in this list is the uh, control data if it exists, the monitoring status, and the number of interactions initially detected, which is one. A couple other things about the wildfire list that I just want to point out to you guys. Um, I'm going to stop this search for a minute. Is if you're looking at a larger area, um, well, anytime, you can click on this arrow up here. This will switch this from a split map um, view to a either a full map view if you hit one of the arrows. Or in the other situation, it'll switch you to a full um, table view. And if you go to this full table view, you can get a little bit more information about these wildfires. You'll notice that there's what we call the right-hand panel um, that populates a little bit more information about the, uh, the fire name, the agency, the acreage, the location, um, and then the start date. And one thing I wanted to point out is this, this control date, containment date, out date, and FTEM date. This is kind of important. As I was saying earlier, it may take uh, up to 45 days for a fire to show up in the system. The source for the wildfire data is um, for point fires, it's coming from Irwin. And for polygon fires, it's, it's coming through GeoMac. Or rather, if, if there's a polygon, that, that polygon source is GeoMac. So if you guys are feeding into some other local reporting systems, those will feed into Irwin and our nightly pulls from Irwin will bring the wildfires in. So 
the way that we look for that data is starting with control date um, and then out date and then containment date. And if those are found, the fire will come in immediately as soon as those dates are populated. And we found with a lot of the BIA data, as is this case, that sometimes those are not populated. There's no way to, a pop to populate those from uh, the systems you're currently using. So in that case, uh, an FTM end date is assigned. Whoops. So this fire started on April 7th, um, and 45 days later, um, an FTM end date was assigned. So that May 22nd day is when it was actually pulled into the system. This will, uh, may be more than you want to know, but that's kind of important to point out. So you'll see in the control date column for this wildfire, or these wildfires I've got listed here, there, it's not populated. If you hover over control date, it's going to say wildfire out control or contain date. So if it's not there, um, then that means it must have used an FTM end date and come in 45 days later. So the bottom line is that you're going to have to be patient for some of your wildfires to actually show up within the system. Also, just to show on this, this uh, full screen view, there's the ability to actually do a little bit of filtering if you wanted to, to check um, the status of your various fires. I don't think there are any yet, but if you, there's any that were in completed status, not started, um, you could filter through them here. I'm going to go back to the split screen view, close my filter, um, just zoom out a little bit. I'm going to try one more time to um, reselect my agency because this isn't quite performing the way I expected it to with the color coding of the wildfires. Just bear with me for a second. Give that a try. Hey, so as Caroline? you look at this, yeah, go ahead, Bill. Um, yeah, I wanted to mention one reason I chose the Canton Lake 2 fire was to emphasize the need for evaluation, um, you know, and, and reiterate what you said earlier, that not every red icon indicates a definite interaction, that, that, the, that they need to be evaluated, because that one, you know, that small fire, I don't know anything about that fire, but the treatment, you know, the the um, buffering halo barely touched the treatment that was on the other side of the road. So if the person responsible for reporting that determines that the fire, in fact, did not intersect with that fuels treatment, then their next step would be to go to treatments and then um, just remove that treatment, correct? That's correct. And I will show that, Bill. I'm just... Um... I'm going to try okay. and log back in to get this to perform a little bit better, but that's correct. In the meantime, were there any um, questions that came in while I get back into the system? Yeah, Daniel had a question. Um, is there only a buffer for point fires rather than polygons? Um, and that is correct. Um, the points are buffered. The the perimeter, or the, the I should say the the radius of the the circle or the buffer around the points is based on the um, acres of the fire. So for smaller fires, like you saw there, it's going to be a very small buffer and for larger fires, it's going to be a larger buffer. Um, the polygons do require direct contact with the treatment to be, um, to be included in that initial um, auto detect that we do at night um, to populate the treatment list. Caroline will demonstrate how you know you can add and remove treatments as well. So yeah, I'll go back to this Canton Lake two fire again. So um, that was a lot on the wildfire tab, but once you you picked your fire again, as I showed, you can zoom to that fire. You'll notice that this Canton Lake fire is showing up as red, meaning there was an interaction detected. So as Bill is alluding to, this needs to be verified by you guys. Um, so all the fires that are going to show up in red is where your work comes in for the area that you're responsible for. So once you click zoom to, again we've got this this halo uh, of interaction and then we've got the treatments showing up here. The treatments are showing up in red as um, potential interactions, again not yet monitored. So the next step after 
selecting your wildfire is to look at the treatments. And you can either uh, click on this treatments button or you can click on this treatments tab. Either, either way gets you to the same place. So I'm going to click on the treatments button. Uh, it's zooming me out a little bit so I can see the entire extent of those treatments. And then you'll notice that the, the treatment's represented by a polygon. So it's got the little square as a symbol instead of a point. If the, there was only a, a point representing the treatment, it would not have the, the halo around it, but it would have the point there. And then I can actually select this treatment with this checkbox, and it'll show up on the map with this hash mark so I can see exactly where that treatment is in relation to the wildfire. So as I think Bill was alluding to, this is um, where the system has auto-detected a treatment, and yet if we zoom in and look, only the local people would know, or if somebody talks to them on the phone, um, whether or not this truly intersected. It's on the other side of the road from the point of origin of the fire. Um, so uh, I did this in a test environment, so I can show you here, just to show you, you can actually just um, remove that treatment if it did not interact. The way to think about this treatment tab is sort of like your Amazon shopping cart. These are your potential treatments that are inter interacted, but you can add and remove treatments as needed. So in this case, I'm going to go ahead and say I'm going to remove that treatment. Um, it'll ask me to verify that. It'll tell me what I'm doing. I can say yes. Remove the interaction. Um, and that treatment will disappear, and suddenly there's no treatment for the Canton Lake 2 fire. And if I go back, you'll notice that the Canton Lake 2 fire is now turned from red which means check for interactions to gray, saying no interactions detected. So here's a way you guys can sort of do your homework. As you go through your fires, you're either monitoring them to the green status of completion or you're turning the red ones to gray if there were truly no interactions. Um, if for some reason the treatment uh, is there and did not show up, you can also add treatments from here. So again, if I'm in the treatments tab, um, I have this add treatments option or I can either add using a button or I can add from the map. If When I remove that treatment, it's not really deleted from the database. The treatment's still here. I can click on that treatment in the map. It's going to highlight the treatment extent and give me a little bit of information about the, the NIPCORS data associated with it. And I can say add interaction. Um, and boom, it's going to come right back into my list. So not that you'd necessarily want to be adding and removing the same treatment, but you get the idea that you can you can be looking around a wildfire finding treatments. Um, here's some down here that are represented by points that we could check out, and they may or may not apply to be added or removed. Um, so that's sort of how that works, and this is where the, the local expertise comes in. I'll just show here's some treatments represented by points. I can click on these, and it looks like that point, um, you know, it actually lists one of five, and you have arrows where you can go through um, so you can see the description, buffalo pens thinning, uh, buffalo pens prescribed fire. So these are overlapping treatments from year to year. Um, and you might be better off, in this case, um, you know, using a, a treatment list to decide what to, to add or remove, but you can do it from the map as well. So that's the treatments tab. And once you um, select the treatments that you want to monitor, you would check them and then proceed on to the third tab, the monitoring tab. Since in this case, uh, this one didn't really interact, I'm going to go ahead and still um, remove that treatment from this one and just leave it gray. And I'll go look at another fire that, that Bill pointed out as an example, which was let's see, the riverbed fire in the San Carlos Apache. So I'm going to clear my search box. I can just pan out and go to that part of the country, or I could type um, in a search box. I come over here, I'm going to say riverbed, um, and hopefully it's going to find that fire for me. I'm in the right place. There it is. Uh, so here's the riverbed fire showing up. It's um, represented by uh, the polygon. It means that we have an actual polygon available for this wildfire, um, 65 acres, and four potential interactions detected. So I'll select that fire. Um, Go ahead and hit the Treatments tab. And that'll again zoom me in with that aqua outline representing the outline of the wildfire perimeter in this case. No longer a buffer, but an actual perimeter. And then we've got polygons for each of these four potential treatment interactions. 
and you can click these on one at a time um, from your treatment list to see exactly where they are on the map in terms of what red on the map is, is demonstrating what. So in this case, I'll turn on this San Carlos Woolly Prescribed Burn, and it should get represented with the crosshatch mark. We can see that if we look at what attribute information we have, we have this same acreage for both of these treatments. We have mechanical treatment um, about six months apart, and then we have uh, prescribed burn. So here's the representation of the footprint of the prescribed burn. If I turn that off and I turn on the mechanical, um, we'll see if it is the exact same footprint as the two of those were. Um, and it looks like it is. So in this case, um, you probably want to remove one of those treatments. This is where uh, policy issues come in. So Bill, I'm going to let you talk a little bit about what you would do um, in terms of these treatments showing up here now. Okay, sure. Um, this actually brings up two um, different issues. The first one is uh, the footprint issue where we have uh, multiple treatments or activities that occur in the same footprint of land. And so typically, you know, you have thinning, maybe piling, and then burning on the same footprint of land, but we only want to uh, report one of those. And in, in the guidance I sent out to folks a couple weeks ago, um, it, it states that the user can, uh, you know, for usually it's gonna be the most recent treatment and so the user can report either the most recent treatment or at their discretion, they can report the treatment that they feel had the most impact on changing fire behavior. But in this case, uh, those two 2017 treatments are the same footprint you can see by the acreage. And so we'd only want to report one of them. And the other issue goes back to what you were saying of, uh, that, you know, this system is populated by other data sources and it's only good as good as those data sources are. And I, I'm not sure about how this completion date, um, the completion dates are basically um, reversed. I confirmed with the San Carlos folks. I mean, yeah, they did the, they did the piling first last year and then did the prescribed mm -hmm. fire afterwards. And so that's just kind of a caution to you know, assess uh, the data that comes in from NIFBORS, and um, you know that you may have some discrepancies like that. But in this case, they'd probably be reporting on the prescribed fire as the one that had the most. Well, it was truly the most recent, but it also probably had the most um, impact on changing fire behavior. Okay, great. Thanks, Bill. So, as I've demonstrated, then I can just check on that mechanical one and remove that treatment. Um, and I just wanted to show you again, if you go into this full screen mode by clicking the arrow, I showed that with wildfires, but the same is true for the treatments uh, within a wildfire. So, in this case, the treatments that you've got come up, and if you again look in the right-hand panel, you'll get a little bit more attribute information about that particular treatment um, in terms of what information came in from NIFPOR. So that might be helpful to you guys to kind of get additional information to make sure you're looking at the right treatment or to verify your treatment data. And again, these, these filters are available. Once you get into the treatments, um, you can filter by all the treatment types that are available in your list. In this case, we just have, I could filter on just the mechanical or just the fire treatments um, if there was some reason you wanted to. Um, so that filtering is available. You just have to remember to turn that off um, when you're done filtering. So in this case, we've removed uh, this treatment here, um, I believe. And now we've got these other two treatments here. We can look at where they occurred on the landscape. We've got the fuel breaks um, and then the mastication. So my map is taking a little bit longer to load today to, I guess, slow internet here. Um, but there's a fuel break, which is a different footprint. 
than the prescribed burn, it looks like. Um, Bill, do you recall in this case which of these other two treatments you would keep or if you would keep them while my map loads? Whether the fuel breaks and the WUI would be kept as well? I believe I believe um, all three of those polygons are slightly different. Okay. So they could um, report all of them. You know, I wanted to also say about those NIFBOR's dates, it's not necessarily that they were in error, but an issue arises when I happen to know, and a lot of agencies probably carry out um, fuels treatments in their WUI areas over a matter of months, uh, potentially. And so, um, you know, they may, you know, a, a, a certain treatment in a particular polygon may have occurred earlier than the um, end date indicates. So, but that's okay. something that the local, the local people will, will know and figure out. Right. So that's how the treatment tab operates. Again, we're in the second tab, and it's primarily your your shopping cart to add and remove treatments to determine which ones truly interacted with the wildfire. Um, once you've done that, the next step will be to actually conduct the monitoring on those treatments. So the way that works is you select the treatments that you would like to monitor, and then you can either click the monitor treatments or just proceed manually to this third tab. And those three treatments will come over with you. Um, and this is where you begin to conduct the monitoring, which is answering the questions, the same questions for those of you that have done FTM monitoring in the past that you've had in the past. So you select a treatment. In this case, I'll, I'll choose this mastication and say enter data. And the screen will pop open um, with the list of questions associated with monitoring. These questions should be familiar to you guys. Um, there are a series of required questions, and those are listed here at the top um, in this first box. Um, it says required, and they're also denoted by a red asterisk. Um, and then the additional questions, of which there are, there are many, are, are optional. I'll just walk you through a few of them to show you, but you'll see right away that um, if it's a polygon-to-polygon -polygon interaction, the system actually will auto calculate the actual interaction acres. So in this case, it's 0.5 acres with this particular mastication treatment. Um, you do need to uh, manually enter that if either one is represent, represented by a point. And then you just go ahead and enter a date, um, time, and the three questions that you're familiar with. Did the fire behavior change as a result? Yes or no. Uh, did the treatment contribute? Yes or no. Um, any comments you would like to populate? Oh, and I skipped the first one. The interaction details is a key question up here. So in this case, we would select the wildfire burn through some acres treated. You just go through and start populating um, the answers to these required questions. And the date field will help you um, and tell you what your errors are if you type in something incorrect. So the fire started May 9th. I'm giving an incorrect date. And I can just correct it. For whoever's fire this is, I'm in a test environment. This data won't really go into your system. Um, and then further down these optional questions, uh, how did the, the treatment contribute to the control of the fire? What was the dominant type of fire spread inside and outside? Flame length, fuel moisture, et cetera. So you can go through and monitor these, these questions and then say save or save and close um, or close and discard. So I'll say save and close. Um, the point being here that you can you can start monitoring and then come back later. You're not required to, to do all your monitoring at what time. Um, and what you'll notice is that now this particular treatment on the map turned from red to yellow, the yellow symbolizing the monitoring in progress for that particular um, treatment and for the wildfire. Another thing to point out here is that you can do some um, batch monitoring or monitoring of uh, several treatments at once for some fields. So if I select these other two treatments and I say enter data, um, I can open up enter data again. 
and the system will tell me which fields are available for um, to be batch monitored and which ones aren't. So I can answer the first question for a multiple number of treatments if they all have the same answer. Um, I'll say run through some acres, but you'll notice that I can't do the treatment acres or the time of intersection because it's uh, assumed that those are going to be different from one treatment to another. So that's just to point out to you guys that if you do have a wildfire with multiple treatments, you can get into this batch mode. And again, I'll say save and close, um, and that should put all the treatments into a, a yellow or partial monitoring status. It's also symbolized by these three lines um, to tell you it's in partial status. Incidentally, now, if, if I go back to the wildfire tab and look at the riverbed fire icon here, it's also yellow to tell us that the monitoring is in progress for that fire, but not yet completed. So this is a good way for you to keep track of what work you still have to be done on your unit if you've started monitoring but you haven't finished. Um, when you open your map up, your fire will be you know, red that you need to check or yellow that you've started and not finished, and it'll be green when you've actually completed it. Another thing that I haven't mentioned yet, but I'll show you here, is there is the ability to add attachments. You can do this from either the wildfire tab or the treatment tab. Um, so from the wildfire tab, this might be where you have uh, pictures of the fire or information about the fire. You select add attachment and just browse files to attach, and it'll go right to your um, directory and let you pick some. Um, at this point, I think we can take JPEGs, PNGs, uh, PDFs, a variety of file types. You can also do it for the treatment at the treatment level by selecting attachment. Um, I think you have to have just one treatment selected at a time. So if there's a particular information about a treatment or a photograph of the fire interacting with just that treatment, you could say attachment and attach it there. Once there is an attachment, I guess I could just show you real quick. Um, I'll put something silly there. The um, not one of my family photos. This could be scary. Um, oh, no, that's not a good one. <laughs> Find that simple one. No, those are not good. Those are family photos. No. Well, this is a little embarrassing. I know I have something simple in here somewhere. Well, I'll just pick a uh, this one. So this one, in this case, is a PNG. You just say upload and attach. And what I want to show you is that um, it'll be symbolized now on your list with a paper clip. So you see this little paper clip icon knowing that there's an attachment. And now when you click on that, um, you can download that. So if someone has done monitoring, say you're in the state office or regional office, and you want to see information about a fire, you can go and download their report or their attachment or something. This will be you know, web-based, available to everyone. So again, you can attach at either the, the treatment level. The cool thing is if you attach even at the treatment level, when you're on the wildfire tab, that icon will still be there, so you can tell that there's an attachment. So if you're just scanning various wildfires, you can see that there's an attachment there. Another thing to know is that the, um, there's something called a uh, table summary, which if I click on that, it's going to give me um, a tabular view of all the information that's been entered on this wildfire. There'll be a header about with the name of the fire, um, cause, acreage, start date, et cetera, and then each treatment uh, that was monitored as interaction is listed, including the monitoring status. And as, as you scroll through, the, the required questions are listed first in the table, rep, uh, represented by the asterisk, and then you can just scroll across and see. When you go all the way to the very end, it'll actually say who did the editing, so you have a record of that as well. And this can be downloaded as an Excel spreadsheet if you choose to. So just another thing to note when you get that table summary tab. So the the um the other thing I want to point out is we've only gone as far as the monitoring tab, and I've showed you how to do the monitoring. Um, the, the final step is to actually complete your monitoring, and that is once you've answered all the required questions, I'm going to switch and go to a fire that already has the monitoring completed. Um, that Bill gave me an example of that someone has actually entered the data for. I believe that's the sand fire. Let's see if I can find it. And the sand fire is down in this area. So 
So this fire should be showing up green on the, the map. For some reason, I'm not refreshing um, quite as well as I should be on the map. Let me just give it one second. And this fire has had three treatments, I believe, that have already been monitoring um, through completed status. So what that means is that all the required questions have been monitored for that fire. Um, and once those required questions are monitoring, you're ready to, to go to the actual complete tab, the fourth tab. You're not done yet. You might think you're done. Um, the actual individual uh, treatments will show up as green, as complete, but the wildfire will still show up as yellow until you actually go through the completion process. So here it is. It's loading now. I can see it. Um, let's close that for a second. So in order, or the way that you actually complete a fire is in this case, there it is finally. So you can see it's represented by green to tell us that the monitoring is completed. So at the completion tab, I'm going to select the fire. Um, this one's already completed, but this button that says amend wildfire right now will say complete wildfire. And that's where you click complete. Um, it tells you how many treatments you had, which in this case was three. How many are in progress? How many have you not started monitoring? And since we know there's total interac interactions of three and three are completed, you could hit complete monitoring. It's good to point out that you can also um, amend a wildfire. So uh, you thought you completed it, and if for whatever reason somebody sends you some photographs um, a month later that you hadn't had before, you can click on amend wildfire um, and just give a reason for amending it. Um, and it'll open that fire up again uh, for you to put in attachments or change an answer or whatever it was. When you go into the amend status, it'll take it from being green back to yellow. So you'd have to re-hit the complete button that'll be available here to actually complete it. So this is an important thing to remember to make it all the way to the fourth tab and hit complete to get your wildfire into a completed status. And again, the table summary is available from here. It's the same as the table summary I already showed you guys. So with that, I'm going to pause for a minute and ask my colleagues here what I've forgotten to demonstrate so far. Okay, okay. It, you've covered covered pretty much everything, but we can we've got a couple questions that we can maybe cover okay. here quick. Um, so um, let's see. Daniel asked, um, "Is there a way to add?" polygons of fires and interactions of WUI sites. I think he's asking, can you add polygons for fires and treatments um, to the system? I, in which case I answered that you can use the upload file to view, um, but not to add to the database. So Caroline, do you want to show the upload tool? Yeah, sure. Um, these icons at the bottom of your map view are called widgets. Um, and this one in the middle, if you hover over it, it says Upload Shapefile. If you select that, um, it'll navigate, um, or you can select Upload Shapefile, and, and then you can navigate within your directory or wherever you want to go to upload a shapefile for either a treatment or a wildfire, which can be really helpful if, for example, you have a, a larger fire like this 6,000 fire that's 3,900 acres, but it's only represented by a point because you can see you don't have a polygon, you just have a flame. So if you have a perimeter for that, you can upload it. Um, you just pick a zip file um, for your, your directory. And uh, I can bring one up just for fun. I think I have some here. Um, and then you'll be able to see it. The only trick is that that is only for, um, here's one. That's only for, uh, this login session only. So you're not permanently uploading these perimeters for the treatments for the polygons um, for the wildfires to the system. You're just adding it enough so that you can actually view it on screen. So in this case, I'm adding a Silveranus fire from, from California. Uh, you'll notice that it's actually going to now show up in my layer list as something I can turn on and off. Um, and there's the fire perimeter um, for the Silveranus fire. So if that was initially represented by a point, but you have that polygon, you can bring it up, and then it'll help you look for your treatment interactions. Again, my 
map is very slow today, but I think, I think you saw a flash of the perimeter. Um, so that answers that question, I believe. Um, yeah, so then, um, thanks, Caroline. Um, another one, Rebecca asked, if the treatment is not showing up, does that mean NIFCORs will be the place to look for it? And that is correct. Um, if it's not showing up in the system, then um, you you could go back, you should go back and look at your system of record for treatments, which would be NIFCORs and and see if it's in there. If it's in there, it's got a complete date, and it's still not showing up, then then we would want to know about that. So I did want to show the reporting real quick, too, um, if there's no other questions right now. Oh, look, the colors are finally working. Um, sorry about that, but now you'll see a little bit better on the wildfire list that this list is all showing red fires. The way this fire list is initially sorted is with the highest number of interactions at the top, and you can sort these however you want. I just switched it to be the lowest number of interactions at the top. If I switch that back, so all your red fires or the fires that need your attention are going to be on the top when you have the number of interactions as, as sorted in this direction. Um, you can also sort by monitoring status, control date, acres, whatever you choose. Now this shows you a little bit better how the map is truly interactive as I zoom in and out. Um, it's got all the red for the fires that need monitoring. Um, it's it's looking within the map extent that I'm zoomed to, or if we go down to uh, where we just compl uh, someone has completed some monitoring for some fires, you'll begin to see the green representing the wildfires that have completed status. So as you go about your work, you can happily watch your your reds turn to yellows and greens. So glad that finally updated. As far as reporting, that's something else that I want to show. So again, I showed from the, the landing page, there was a reports button, or I can go on this navigation bar um, and click reports. And that's going to take us to the reporting menu. Um, currently, uh, there's a pick list for the report type, and there's five different types of reports available to you. I will say that since we're just starting to put data into the system here in 2018 and the 2017 and prior data is not loaded, um, a lot of these reports will not be as useful to you right now. Um, but the wildfire report, this one is of interest because it's for a single wildfire. The caveat is that you have to have gone to that fourth tab and completed the monitoring for a fire and, and turned it green before you can generate a wildfire report. And like I said, if you Put it in amend status it won't be available here but now if i go and i look for completed fires so i want to look for a report on i can sort by agency by the year um, and then it'll build me a list of what fires are available um, and in this case we did this we're looking at the sand fire and you say generate report and in a new tab it's going to open up a report for you you'll notice that you get a big blue message across the top saying um, please wait, we're generating a map image. But you can see already that the, um, the header is populated with a variety of information about that fire. This is similar to the table summary. Um, and then the treatments that were monitored and the responses to the monitoring questions. If the questions that were optional were not answered, it just says null. Um, and this report is downloadable um, as either a PDF or as an Excel spreadsheet. Um, so that kind of handy if you wanted to download um, PDF. I I just asked it to. Um, I can show you what the it looks like. I might wait a second to see if the report image shows up. Hmm. Hmm. Try it again. I'm having a few technical difficulties with the report image, but once the fire is completed, typically you will get a report image, um, and then you can download it as a PDF, and you'll get a PDF of not only um, the tabular information, but also the map. The other reports that are available are, um, like I said, not going to be 
as a as as much as much use until more data gets in the system. But for example, you can do an agency summary for the BIA, but it's only going to have what folks have entered this year, so it's not going to be too exciting yet. We want people to be aware of that. Right now, it's got um, very very little information in it, so people shouldn't be generating these reports and then get concerned that their data has not been compiled. The, the information from 2017 and prior is still um, in the old system and reports are available from that, but that's not integrated with the system at this time. So that's just the situation for the agency summary as well as the region and state summaries, just new data. And then this FTM data download, um, again, you could you could select BIA and this would be more for, for maybe the regional or national office folks, but you can pick the agency, the year, um, you can pick a range of years, and then you can actually download an Excel spreadsheet uh, of the entire duration um, if you choose to. So with that, Bree, are there any more questions that have come in? No more questions. We had a person that was had some account issues, and I just will um, chime in and say that if you are need need edit access and you're only seeing the wildfire and treatment tab. Um, when you go into FTEM monitoring, it's because you have not been granted edit access yet. So you could go to your user profile and check just to make sure that you've requested edit, edit access. Um, and the next thing I would do is contact your uh, FTEM agency administrator because um, they are the ones who will be granting you that access. Anything else, Bill? that you'd like me to cover? Did you want to show the help system, Caroline? Uh, I can do that. A little bit? I mean, just a snapshot yeah, of where sure. they can find it. What's and, up, Bree? Uh, as well. Nope, oh, nothing, nothing for me. OK. Um, yeah. So there's, you have go to, F, this from the landing page, you have go to FTEM help button here. Um, these are links within the help, or you have the help up here. If you click the help up on the tab, um, you'll notice also that there's a request support, which is where you would submit a help desk ticket uh, if you had any issues, um, say, with account access or or even a, a question. Um, but before you submit a ticket, we would ask that you look um, at some of the help content. We also have a support forum that sort of is a frequently asked, it's not frequently asked questions, but it's a What's that called? Um, where users can talk to one another as well as to the FTDIS team, and we can um, have a dialogue about certain issues with it. Um, if you actually click on Help Center, you'll go to the FTDIS um, page Help, and then on the right hand side, there's specific FTEM information. So you've got about FTEM uh, accounts and permissions, so creating account roles and permissions detailed roles, how to use FTEM, so like what I just showed with adding, um, viewing shape files or adding and viewing attachments, symbology, what all those colors mean. Um, there's also links to the monitoring guidance and policies, um, how the reports work, and as I mentioned earlier, I think the technical documentation for the sources for the wildfire data, for the treatment data, and also how the system does its initial check for interactions between wildfires and treatments. And then lastly, the um, frequently asked questions. Anything else I should point out there, Kim? No, I think you got it. And just to let folks know, we'll yard up some of the questions that were asked today and um, include those in an email to everybody as well as a link to the recording to this webinar in case you want to review it again or share it with somebody else who maybe wasn't able to attend today. So that'll go out probably in the next day or so, Monday at the latest, if not tomorrow. All right, great. Well, thanks everyone for attending. And Bill, any final words? Uh, yeah, Caroline, just um, one thing I wanted to say about the 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 question, the fire behavior question, did it change fire behavior or did it not? You know, I want to emphasize that there's no right or wrong answer there. There's no good or bad answer. You know, um, 
there's legitimate reasons why a treatment may not affect um, fire behavior. Extreme fire weather, for example, especially wind, or maybe um, that's an incomplete series of treatments, you know, the treatment really hasn't been completed. Or um, something that's common in Indian country is that the treatment may have been designed for only short-term effectiveness in some of our uh, flashy fuels kinds of places. And, um, you know, that, so answering no, where a treatment, you know, that was designed to be effective in grass for only a year or two, and it's now four to five years old, that's a totally legitimate answer. And it helps really as a rationale for why we need to do frequent fuels treatment. So just just that, and uh, just thanks again to the IFTI DIS uh, tech folks there for for these webinars, and um, thanks to all the attendees. We had really good um, attendance. Uh, just have you know some patience. I know learning a new system, learning new software, always requires a little patience. But use the really great help content there, and don't be shy about um, suggesting enhancements through the feedback system. Thanks, you guys. Absolutely. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a good day.